Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. We've started the recording, so let's pray and uh, we will get into today's class. I'll just begin with a word of prayer. Abba Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives. Father, we We lost the connection for a bit. Uh, sorry about that. Let's get right into our uh, subject. So we've been talking about and in the last class. We explained that the fivefold ministry offices are from God, and there is nothing in Scripture that says that today we don't have these offices. So just as much as uh, <clears throat> We accept the office of a prophet or a teacher or a pastor. Even apostle is an office that exists. And uh, we will continue to see apostles rise up in our midst. Uh, and, and that is something that uh, we must be prepared for. We've seen how God in the last 500 years has restored many things back to the church. And we know that before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the church as a body is being strengthened in terms of our understanding of the word, the work of the spirit. And so God is, uh, you know, he, there are all these restorative moves of God. And currently the move that we are in, we know that uh, the fivefold ministry offices are being restored. And uh, we also looked at the fact that the Lord Jesus, he is an apostle. He was in the in the calling of an apostle as well, or he is in the calling of an apostle as well. And we understood the meaning of that word apostle. It simply means sent from someone and uh, a good representative. And since the term has come from more of a uh, like a military usage, we also know that it has to do with kingdoms and how establishing a kingdom, kingdom culture used to happen in the past and uh, even today. In a spiritual sense, that's what we are looking at when we talk about an apostolic work being done. And there are categories of apostles, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. There is the founding apostles such as you know Paul, Peter, John, who have uh, worked or strived as far as the doctrine is concerned. So uh, we have the doctrine today. That can't change. Uh, but when we talk about the office of, a, of an apostle, uh, they will not be a founding apostle. However, they will have an apostolic role in whatever God calls them to do. And uh, the, the last point here in our note says that even women can be apostles. One of the notable apostles, women apostles in scripture is a lady by the name of Junia, uh, whom Paul commends or he appreciates her. That yeah, she's, a, uh, you know, she's like a uh, what noted, noted apostle among people. So can women be apostles? Answer is yes, even women can be apostles. So now we go to understanding the apostolic ministry in the New Testament. Uh, obviously, it began with uh, Jesus and his disciples, the 12 disciples of the Lamb. And what do we see 
as far as their work or their ministry is concerned, they um, they were commissioned or they, they were appointed by Jesus to go and do the works of God just the way Jesus did it. So we know, right? Like in Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, Jesus tells them, now you go. You do the supernatural works and uh, you minister to the people. So what are apostles supposed to do? They're supposed to go and uh, reach out to people and uh, do the works of God. That's what we see the 12 disciples do. Now, when we come to the book of Acts, uh, there again, you know, we see many scriptures about Peter and John and um, Paul and Barnabas. So, I mean, primarily these people who are in the apostolic uh, office. Now, what are their functions? We learn from their functions. What are the things that they did? You know, things like preaching, things like teaching, things like, um, uh, you know, establishing the church. Uh, then the government of the church. What is government? Government is like um, the, the right things, right? Like in terms of the doctrines, in terms of the, the Christian life, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what is ministry, how it should be done instructions uh, and of course the demonstration of the supernatural so broadly i'm just putting it broadly if we look at our notes here there are many uh, scriptures for us to look at and uh, read through so i would encourage us to go and do that uh, and uh, you would notice that the ap apostles worked in all these areas okay so there's there's a whole bunch of uh, um, like like reaching out to people through preaching, teaching, uh, as well as, you know, church administration and government. So one key time when you see um, the, the church standing up for what is right is uh, in Acts 15. So what exactly happens in Acts 15 is that there is uh, a, a rule which people are trying to make for the converted Gentiles or uh, we can use the term those who became believers yeah among the gentiles and uh, the uh, the instruction that went out was to say that they must now be circumcised so then the apostles along with the leaders they decide and they say that look jews are by uh, culture and by tradition, circumcised. It's not necessary for a Gentile to be circumcised. Now, I mean, a Gentile, they have been brought up in their own way. And now that they've become a believer, uh, should every believer, or let me put it this way, anyone who is a Christian, should they become circumcised? That's a question in the church, right? Around the Acts 15 time. And the apostles make a decision. And it's quite clear. They discuss they decide and we are told that decrees like a decree is sent out to the uh, people around clear cut they put it down in writing uh, and the announcement is made so there is no confusion so this is what church government is about meaning uh, we are the church is is uh, governed or guided by scriptural principles see if on that day, they would not have stood up regarding circumcision. Then what happens? Uh, circumcision would have become essential. But is that what Jesus said? Did Jesus preach about circumcision? No. It's, it was all about believing in God by, you know, uh, by faith and, uh, and the aspect of grace in salvation. So where is circumcision? So they were true to the scriptures and they did not allow this whole circumcision tradition to come in. So that is church government. That's very apostolic. To guide the people in the right doctrine. To guide the people as per the scriptures. Right? So uh, that is what their functions were about. So here in our notes, we would see an enlisting of the key things observed as in the book of Acts. Teaching, yes, of course, we find they were teaching. Where are the examples of this? You would find that, uh, uh, you know, when Philip went to Samaria and there were many people who started believing in God, 
that was just the beginning of their journey they did not know about holy spirit baptism they did not know about you know uh, the power of the spirit then we see in acts 8 that from the church of jerusalem they sent peter and john to samaria why so that the people are taught about baptism in the holy spirit right similarly acts 19 that's another place where about the holy spirit people were not aware but the apostles bring in the understanding okay so teaching teaching is a key uh thing to do in the apostolic why 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 is teaching so important yeah the doctrines because unless we know the doctrines you know some things which are uh not not compromisable then how will we as believers live our lives we need to right like it it affects our worship it affects our life it affects our ministry and so teaching is very important then we see um the supernatural signs wonders and miracles where do we see this we see um you know particularly i mean we see so many miracles starting from uh, acts 3 acts 3 the lame man at the gate beautiful he was raised up he was able to walk then later on we find scriptures where through the hands of the apostles god did many miracles okay that is a part of the anointing the apostolic anointing right so signs wonders and miracles it's very much a part of the apostolic uh church administration we've already talked about it preaching preaching is to proclaim the gospel so that is also part of the apostolic leadership authority uh we see people like uh, paul if we only consider the book of acts also we'll see that he is planting churches in different cities now what kind of leadership one is of course planting the church they go with the team uh they preach the gospel there are people who come to believe then what to do when they're leaving the city the work will see imagine people have believed in god right and the the team paul and his team are moving on from there now if they just move on and they don't think about the people who are now believers in that city what will happen just think about this they're just traveling ministers going everywhere and they just move on yeah they might go astray astray and remember we said teaching is necessary establishing them in the doctrine is necessary discipleship is necessary um you know and also leading them in the work of the spirit baptism in the holy spirit gifts of the spirit um uh, and appointing leaders in the church when you see how the way paul works in the ephesian church what he does is uh, before he goes right in acts 20 you read about him calling the leaders of the efficient church where did the leaders suddenly come from because they were appointed so that is what we call as church government right so there are leaders because preaching the gospel and bringing people to christ is one thing discipling them and uh, raising up leaders strengthening the body of believers in a particular region guiding them you see there are so many things to do all that is part of uh, apostolic work apostolic work right uh, and and so you find paul exercising leadership authority you know when he writes his letters to the ephesians he says you know uh, ephesians uh, stand up against uh, uh, like uh, the demonic kingdom the powers of darkness put on the full armor of god so there is instruction he talked he writes to the galatians he says uh, who has bewitched you uh, why are you listening to all kinds of new teachings is that what was taught to you who speaks like that right who speaks like that unless they have that authority over the people so uh, he was concerned about the people that they may go astray with the wrong teaching so he kind of uh, charges them in a in a fatherly way and says please don't leave what you have already learned so all this is the apostolic leadership authority appointing leaders 
how can he appoint unless he carries that authority right so are you all understanding this is how the apostolic looks so they are establishing proper uh, you know like a proper government i think government only is the word government over the church so how is it different from the pastoral work just a question to us because even pastor will engage in teaching discipling people mm. yeah yeah yes 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 mm. correct so it's a little broader than pastoral ministry but pastoral ministry will have these features they would teach and preach and move in the supernatural take care of the people administration all that is there but the level at which you will see it in the case of an apostle is way higher yeah pastors is huh yeah so pastoral is more like shepherding uh, they are mostly concerned with their their sheep no so the term pastor itself it it it, it means shepherd like there are really a difference like pastoral is what is something for like yes mm ha uh, yeah ha uh. okay no you're saying in the context of a big church the pastor will not go to every home you're saying so then like what exactly is the question ha uh. Mm. Mm. Uh. Mm. Yeah, so see, uh, it, it comes together, uh, uh, Anand. So, for a pastor, the overall broad objective is to take care of the sheep. That's what a, a pastor is all about, the sh a shepherd is all about. so as a shepherd right uh, what are we supposed to do we have to build them up in the word of god so then the grace of teaching is given to the pastor to some extent we can teach right then preaching because we have to proclaim the gospel and new people are coming in so we can uh, we have that grace to do it and also this aspect is there to take care of the people like imagine we are only preaching and teaching but we don't care for their lives that's where the whole mentoring comes in the caring for people comes in member care comes in you know like usual aspects uh, come in without caring how can a pastor only preach and teach no why the reason we are preaching and teaching only is for the people so we we want to build up the people so the point i'm trying to make is like even member care um interacting with the person building up the person and maybe you know visit spend time it's all pastoral it's pastoral yeah it's an aspect it it's got to be an aspect now i understand when it comes to like a mega church right every mega church may have their strategy for example if a church has 50 members it's reasonable the pastor can visit everyone spend time with everyone now if the church has 50000 members tell me how a pastor can visit them cannot so then strategy so we may have a member care team but it comes under the pastoral ministry only so ultimately the pastor is the one who is kind of guiding these teams and saying okay i can't visit but you make sure they are fine you know if they are sick or they are all that Mm 
if the member care team is there then okay okay yeah it will it member care team okay so prince your question is that uh, even if there's a member care team then people will seek the pastor's guidance for major issues in their lives i agree with you that's what the, most of the people want to do so what i have seen um, in practice among the many churches that i know is though there's a member care team generally they will give uh, some way to contact the pastor directly so in most churches the pastor also spends time directly with the people they can write or they can call and come and catch up now if it becomes too many people because i've heard uh, uh, churches like in north uh, in uh, south korea that uh, big church no uh, yongicho yongicho's church and all he talks about how he is just not able to like he does not know also how many people are there who are the people because it's it's running into uh, you know thousands of people and he has a uh, he has an army of volunteers so basically they are the ones who can they go they take care they keep in touch with the people as a pastor he just cannot uh, i mean uh, he wasn't able to after the church grew so big so a church can come to a place where that might happen which is where like good administration comes in handy when we have guidelines we have proper trainings we have proper feedback mechanisms then it's okay even if pastor is not engaging directly can still maintain so yeah so this is what the apostolic uh, uh, looks like so pastor can do this to an extent i think paul apostle paul is a very good example for us to understand the apostolic he was like a shepherd but at the same time he is going to new territories you understand like expansion that's on his mind and it's not just one church in a pastoral kind of a role a pastor may even have five churches but we may not call them an apostle just having more churches doesn't make one an apostle got it um but can an apostle be like a pastor does he have features of a pastor yes that can happen that can happen so these are the differences yeah. mm -hmm. okay so uh, if uh, anyone is called to be an apostle should they be like apostle paul no answer is no features characteristics we can take you know things like expand expansion of the kingdom you know more people getting saved all that we can take but should they be exactly like paul you know being able to um what can i say you know all his his strengths of writing a letter and uh, being that strong leader and all may not necessarily look like that you know we'll come later there are names like uh, um barnabas barnabas is called an apostle but you don't see him doing things like paul correct personality wise also he's so different and uh, yeah you don't we don't see much written about barnabas but i'm sure he has expanded the kingdom of god and there's a certain way in which he has ministered you see there are other names actually this uh, next section right here in our notes on page 4 andronicus junia silas timothy titus james right these people are also called apostles but their work was obviously slightly different as compared to paul so you don't have to be exactly like paul to be known as an apostle okay great so now we we are understanding the characteristics right of an apostle fine so few more things to add to that is persecution so when it comes to uh being attacked 
for the sake of the gospel. In the book of Acts, we see that it was generally the apostles who were the first target. So uh, James, one James is killed. And then Peter is imprisoned. In the beginning, Peter and John are interrogated. Right? And later on, again, Paul finds opposition everywhere. He, as the leader, is facing the, like he's in the front lines of persecution. So it tends to happen. And that's what we see in the book of Acts also. Those who are apostles end up getting the first, uh, you know, I, I know what you call it, like the attack of uh, persecution. And so it kind of, and also see, we are talking about entering new territory, right? So when it, entering new territory, is it easy? It's very difficult. So we use terms like pioneer. We'll come to it later. Pioneer means somebody who's doing something for the first time that hasn't been done before. So if something has been done before, like just think with me, we are going into a place which is like a jungle. If people have been there before, we may find a road because there are many people who have left a trail. You just walk through the road. They've already cut the trees for us. They've already cleared the way for us. Fine. There's a trail. But when we talk about pioneering, it's like saying you're the first person who's gone there. And the first person has to cut the trees and deal with the uh, you know, wild beasts, animals, and make the path. We are making the path. We are setting the trend. So it's a high call. It's a tough call. Can there be opposition when these things are being done? Definitely. It's going to be hard. Not everybody can accept it. So the apostolic is a little bit like that. You know, like pioneering, courage. We'll come to many other aspects later. Courage, boldness, being able to step out, do a new thing. Uh, and when these things are happening, we can expect opposition and even maybe persecution. So that is a part of the apostolic in the book of Acts. Um, strengthening of the local church. We see that in the book of Acts. They strengthen the local church in many different ways. Uh, if there are problems in the local church, that is addressed. Have you noticed? He writes to the Corinthian church, Paul. He says, look, we should not be carnal. We truly have to be spiritual. So what is that? Strengthening the church. Church should not become weak in any way. So if there are issues, addressing them. Then, um, you know, if there is a, a, a difficult season that people are going through, for example, uh, you know how there's a famine that is announced, right? Uh, but relief is sent. Relief is sent from some churches to the church that uh, is in famine. So what is that? Helping in a physical way, in a natural way, as well as in a spiritual way. So all that Paul was overseeing, making sure in no way the church should become weak. Right? So it's an amazing, every call is amazing, but you know, the apostolic is kind of, you're like, wow, what a grace to have to be able to take care of so many things. Uh, and uh, so that's what the picture of the apostolic looks like, strengthening the local church in every way. Expand into new territories. So that's quite obvious in the book of Acts. They are moving. Uh, as Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, um, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So uh, they are taking the gospel out to various regions. When we come to our the apostolic today, we'll have a discussion about that. It does not only mean geography. For example, you know we are in a certain country, and then we go to another country. To proclaim the gospel and you know um, the spiritual kingdom of God is is taken into that nation. That's that's part of uh, ministry, but there are other spheres too. Like for example, um, what about impacting the sports uh, area with with the gospel with biblical principles? Maybe the area of sports, nobody's thought about it. But when somebody 
you know, the apostolic is that. We take the kingdom not just to, you know, like new geographical territories, but also other zones. So sports, what about entertainment? Uh, like transform the world of entertainment. That's apostolic. New content, you know, excellent content, uplifting content. When people start doing these things, it's new territory. What about technology? You know, so in the when we talk about apostolic today, the new territories look like that. It need not only be I'm leaving this country, I'm going to another country. That's one. But there's more than that. What about, you know, I keep thinking um, uh, kids, right? Kids. Um, uh, like whenever we're doing some storytelling for uh, my niece, nephew, and all, some of the books that we read, and I'm always hoping, hey, if somebody can write a better story or give some good values in the stories, the illustrations, it makes such an impact on the children around the world, right? These are all unex or it is being explored. But can you think with me? These are all the opportunities. Apostolic uh, can impact, you know, all these areas. We can think in a different way. What about the world of gaming? You know, gaming is a big deal nowadays. A lot of people engage. Uh, it's just part of your, uh, you know, what, what people have as entertainment. But there's so much of violence, there's so much of unnecessary things that go on. What if, uh, you know, a believer makes a mark in that area of gaming, right? These are ways in which we can be apostolic in our generation. OK, uh, so there's so much, actually. It's very exciting to think about the apostolic in our time. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> You're asking me? OK. Huh. Huh. Okay. Mm. Okay. So for the online students, uh, the bachelor is asking me about one particular individual. If I would call that person an apostle, thankfully they're not holding the mic. So you've not heard the name of the person. I would say yes. I would, it's my personal opinion. I would say yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I feel like uh, there are signs of, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, that's my personal opinion. Sure. <laughs> yeah, true, true. We can see the expansion happening, right? So, yeah. Okay. Tough question. <laughs> anyway, I escaped. All right. So um, now we are understanding what the apostles in the New Testament did and how their function really is. Um, and to also, we'll come to all this later. It, it sounds very grand. It sounds very powerful that human beings can be like this, uh, having so many abilities, the grace of God, and engaging in so many activities and being a blessing to uh, the people around and even for the coming generations. It makes a difference, isn't it? When someone has has gone into new places and established um, uh, God's doctrines and principles and all. So it sounds very grand, but I want us to remember that apostles are just ordinary men and women of God, graced by God in this office. So uh, we must never really, I mean, we tend to do that when it comes to all uh, callings, all uh, offices, where we see the grace of God on people's lives, and somewhere we put them on a pedestal. 
yeah so yes it's the grace of god yes we must honor but god must always hold the highest uh, honor and respect in our hearts so they are just ordinary men and women of god but appointed by god we honor that we honor that and um, you know we we uh, give them that due respect so here in our notes names of different apostles has been mentioned uh, paul barnabas andronicus junia silas there are references given alongside where we can go and check it up uh, timothy titus james uh, and uh, others a few more thoughts here about uh, the apo apostolic now that we've seen all these different names what we are also saying is that the operation of the ministry gift can be very different so it's like the apostolic anointing right the anointing is there and it is given to different individuals the way it it is expressed the way it is demonstrated can be quite different right in each case like i already gave the example when we see paul quite different from barnabas quite different from timothy um and so we should not think that it's a formula like every person uh who is an apostle should look like you know they should look like each other like do they look like this do they do like this then only they are an apostle so it's not a formula we will not be able to uh you know box up people in a certain system to be able to call them apostle right so we cannot force that uh, operation of the ministry gifted to a formula all that we have done today is just broad guidelines very broad guidelines so those have been established <coughs> now on the basis of these names that we listed out uh over and above the book of acts we've stated in our notes the activities of you know all these people also like we now included timothy and others so what are the uh the works that we see we find that there is the establishing of establishing and building of local churches so people were involved in that um so that is part of the apostolic opening up new doors to the unreached or opening new territories for the gospel we have already seen that that's also part of the apostolic um equipped with the power gifts of the spirit so that power gifts mean supernatural we we are able to demonstrate the supernatural that is part of the apostolic equipped with revelatory gifts what are revelatory gifts among the gifts of the spirit the ones that are about um, revelation like word of knowledge word of wisdom prophecy those are revelatory gifts so we find that uh, people in the apostolic also carry revelatory gifts do prophets have it yes but then apostles also are graced with it to a certain extent then equipped with strong leadership and administration capabilities so this is a very unique feature very unique feature uh, do pastors have administrative abilities to some extent yes but we would find that the apostle will have it to a large extent like they'll be capable of managing uh, like really amazing administrative responsibilities or work uh, and so that is quite uh, important in the apostolic anointing and also strong leadership strong leadership how to be a leader to lead from the front right that is a part of the apostolic they're able to steer people forward that's a good thing but it can also be a very dangerous thing because hopefully the person is good and they are fully committed to the call of god and they they are leading in the right way now what if they are not see people are willing to follow strong apostolic anointing lots of people will follow but if there are mistakes 
it affects everyone right so uh, all these offices and the anointing everything comes with responsibility and uh, when it done right done well it's such a mighty blessing so with regard to the apostolic strong leadership and administration capabilities are a part of it we find in first corinthians chapter 12 verse 28 uh, there is the greek word for government which is kuber and the apostles are the ones who who uh, are involved in church government so what does that mean that word kuber means to steer or to pilot okay those who are at the steering wheel of a car they are the ones who are taking the car somewhere everyone else is just following followers or a pilot they are the ones who are taking the the plane somewhere so they have these abilities to lead many people and uh, governmental authority governmental authority stand is is more about establishing the right structure um you know the right doctrine and all of all of those things so that is also part of it yeah here it's been explained further so as part of church government appoint local leadership that is a responsibility of the apostolic to appoint the right leaders you've done house of god okay okay so you know so the right person uh, in the right place at the right time right so that is uh, uh, right leadership appoint local leadership then establish divine order what is divine order divine order means there is the authority gateway right the way things have to be done in a church we can't be haphazard if god has appointed leaders given grace to different people there's a right way of doing things right so that has to be honored that is divine order like even uh, there's a book i'm sure you all have read it in some of your courses in divine order it's about respecting authority respecting god's government in that local church so even when things are done for example let's say uh, you know between churches we have to respect that there's an order we have to go through the pastor of that church we can't just do whatever we like isn't it so that's divine order so divine order who will establish this the apost the apostles and the apostolic so when we see some of the writings of paul sometimes he gets angry when people are disrupting order and you wonder like paul like relax why are you getting upset the apostolic is about divine order is the right way that god has established we can't break that order and that's not right okay so divine order uh, authority to bring correction to local churches and we've discussed about it and paul did that uh, responsibility toward and care for the churches and that's part of what paul did and other ministers did uh, and uh, you know these are these are all things that are done along with that teaching praying uh, for the local church and ensuring that the church grows up and how will the church grow up along with the teaching activating the gifts of the ministry uh, gifts of the spirit imparting a gift if you recall the writings of paul he says i was waiting to come to you so that i could impart a gift to you so spiritually developing the people that is part of uh, the apostolic and um, yeah relating to other apostles and elders it's a really nice teamwork if you see paul's team also they all work together isn't it so many names are mentioned there are other people who are apostles also who paul is working with so uh, yeah so all this is even relating to other leaders other elders apostles it's a part of the apostolic anointing and so we observe this and uh, it's more like ultimately if you see the picture that we get of the apostle and we'll take paul as an example is more like a father right a spiritual father to many leaders grooming them up raising them up equipping them 
so that the work of God can go on, it can impact many generations to come. So that's the broad picture of the uh, apostolic. In the next class, we'll read a little bit about the shaping of an apostle, and I'll try and summarize the other chapters. I'm, I'm trying to summarize as much as possible. That way, we get more out of our discussion. Huh? Yeah, yeah, we'll be done. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, and I'm yet to post the additional yeah, um, videos for the prophetic. Right. So any questions, any thoughts as we close today? Okay. Yeah, just let the apostolic sink in and uh, we'll uh, pick it up on. Yeah. Oh, question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. So, can an apostle have a home church? Like they are the like pastor of the church. Yes. So, a person can be a an apostle pastor. Can be. Yeah, correct. In the case of Paul, it's a little different. He appoints someone to be the pastor. No, it can be a combination. So somebody can be an apostle pastor also. So taking care of the church, but actually the calling is apostolic. So they're constantly trying to expand as possible. Does everyone need a home church? Huh. Mm. For the for the minister, ministry offices, yes. Um, see, when we look at, uh, we'll go back to the example of Book of Acts. They had a home church. Like even Paul, Barnabas, they used to keep coming back to Antioch because that's where they started out their ministry. But then the mother church was in Jerusalem. So initially it's Antioch. And then they start kind of connecting to the Church of Jerusalem, like reporting to the Church of Jerusalem and all. Uh, they are well linked. Even when Paul goes back to Jerusalem, he's in sync with the leaders of the Church of Jerusalem. So it's uh, that's how they did it. So my answer would be yes. What church? I've never heard. Oh, Mother Church. Okay, so wherever you go, you should come to the Mother Church. Tithe. Tithe to the church. See, we, we are supposed to give the tithe to the church where we are being spiritually fed. Okay, so uh, I would say whichever church you are, because when you say Mother Church, what does it mean? Is it the church where you were born? Where you started? Where you started? Mm. Mm -hmm. That's the mother church, is it? I, I haven't heard about this uh, concept. Oh, in your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so see, I can only tell you, <laughs> I think I can tell you uh, my experience. So when I was studying, I had to move out of Bangalore and uh, live elsewhere. And I was attending a church. There was no branch of APC uh, over there. So I spoke to pastor. I went there and I asked him, what should I do? He said, you be planted there. You serve there. 
and uh, don't worry like don't worry about apc you'll be a blessing there that's what he told me so then i went and i was working uh, i mean studying all that i was serving there volunteering i was also giving my tithe to that church at that point but of course i would send some like you know to apc also i had a commitment and uh, in my heart i felt that i am so connected to apc so that connection is there but then my tithe as such if you ask me i was giving it there so yeah 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 they took care of us yeah yeah so uh yeah so the question is wherever we grew up wherever we were baptized wherever we came to know the lord that our commitment to that place always remains and tithe has to go there is it that's the thing uh see in the present the church that is nurturing us uh like i i see it that way the commitment is to that church to give the tithe but in my heart if i am still feeling for my other church i can send there also like maybe a portion there also yeah but you're saying this tradition exists <laughs> Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, congregation. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, honestly, I've never thought about this. This is like the first time I'm even thinking about it. So I have to look at uh, scriptures on this. Oh, is it right to call people and tell? Huh? Tithe. To call people and say you have to give the tithe. No, no. See, we can teach people about the tithe and the blessing of the tithe, right? It's a we are, uh, huh? And it's left to the people to give. We can teach them. We can help them understand. Beyond that, we can't say, we can't track. <laughs> you know, tithe. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Mm. <laughs> okay, I think I have to uh, read more about it. Uh, I, I have no context. Okay, so thank you. Let's pray and then we'll close. Let's pray and I just want to request one of us to lead in prayer. Oh, either, anyone. Father, we thank you for this time once again. And we praise you, worship you, Father, what we have learned today, Lord Jesus. Help us to understand more deeply about all things what uh, we learned through Nancy, man. Thank you, Father, for teaching us. In Jesus' name, I'm. amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. God bless.